I guess, yeah. I had lunch with Hakwa. I'm sorry? I had lunch with Hakwa. You had lunch with Hakwa? Yeah. Oh. And then he's going out to meet Richard. And, uh, he's going out to meet Richard? He was at Yale. What, what is it? I see. So he just had a quick lunch. Oh, that's nice. Uh, Yeah, uh, family issue. They were supposed to meet at JFK. To, to Richard was very good, but he couldn't. He didn't think it would go. Hawkwind was going to come here. Okay. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Um, welcome to Helix Center. Uh, my name is Gerald Horowitz. I'm the Associate Director of Helix. Ed Nersessian. Can people hear me? Okay. No. No. Okay. I'll speak louder, but I. We'll get a little bit more uh, amplification. So my name is Gerald Hurowitz. I'm uh, the Associate Director of Helix Center. Uh, Ed Nersessian, our uh, Executive Director, is out today, unfortunately for him, because we have a wonderful program, and I think that's reflected in this wonderful turnout we have here today. So welcome, everybody. Uh, before we get started, I want to mention our uh, two of our upcoming panels, the roundtables. On March 14th, we're having a roundtable on the many minds of memory. And then on April 18th, the topic will be ethics and AI, artificial intelligence and ethics. So let me do a brief uh, introduction to our panelists today. The discussion today um, is based on Joseph Ledoux's new book, Um, on the emotional brain and uh, let me just say a few words about Joseph and we'll go through the rest of the panelists. So Joseph Ledoux is the Henry and Lucy Moses Professor of Science at NYU in the Center for Neural Science. He also directs the Emotional Brain Institute located at the Nathan Klein Institute at NYU and is a professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Department of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry at NYU Langone Medical School. His work is focused on the brain mechanisms of memory and emotion. Ledoux is the author of The Emotional Brain, which is the, the basis of our talk today, The Synaptic Self, and Anxious. The latter received the American Psychological Association William James Book Award. Ledoux has also written about the brain for the New York Times and Huffington Post. He's received a number of awards, including the Carl Spencer Lashley Award for, from the American Philosophical Society, the Frizen International Prize in Cognitive Science, the Jean Louis Signoret, Jean Louis Signoret Prize of the Ibsen uh, Foundation, the Santiago Grisolia Prize, the American Psychological Association Distinguished Scientific Contributions Award, the, and that's enough. That, that, no, and the list really goes on, and it's quite wonderful and impressive at the same time. His most recent book is The Deep History of Ourselves, The Four Billion Year Story of How We Got Conscious Brains, and that's the title of our talk today. Kristen Lindquist, who I'm imagining you can identify because she's our sole uh, woman on the panel today, is an associate professor at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, where she has appointments in the Department of Psychology and Neuroscience and the Biomedical Research Imaging Center in the School of Medicine. She directs the Carolina Effective Science Lab, which uses tools from behavioral science, physiology, and neuroscience to examine how our social worlds bodies and brains conspire to create emotion. She's interested in how emotion and emotion regu emotional regulation varies across the age span in health and disease and across cultures. Carl Nicholas, you'll raise your hand since you're not as easy to identify there, although the beard helps. Carl J. Nicholas is the Liberty Hyde Bailey Professor of Plant Biology Emeritus in the School of Integrative Plant Science, Cornell University. His research is in the plant biophysics, is in plant biophysics and evolution, with a particular focus on the evolution of biomechanics, complexity, and multicellularity. <clears throat> he has written over 400 peer-reviewed articles and five books, and they're listed here. You could find them on your um, 
on your introduction to the uh, talk today. He's a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the Institute of Advanced Study at the Wissenschaft Kolleg in Berlin, and the American Association for the Advancement of Science. David Rosenthal is professor of philosophy at the Graduate Center of the City University of New York with courtesy appointments in linguistics and cognitive neuroscience. He's also the coordinator of the Graduate Center's interdisciplinary concentration in cognitive science. He has published widely on consciousness, the mental qualities of perceiving and sensation, the representational character of thought, the nature of emotions, the self, and related topics, including his 2005 book, Consciousness and Mind. His work on consciousness advances the theory that a psychological state is conscious if it is accompanied by a thought to the effect that one is in that state. He's also published in The Nature of Emotion, The Mind-Body Problem, and The Relation of Thought and Speech. And I am the last panelist. Uh, as I mentioned, Gerald Hurwitz, I'll just say I'm a clinical neuropsychiatrist and psychopharmacologist who practices here in New York City and I'm in faculty at Columbia University. So we're going to begin with Joseph Ledoux giving a brief sort of precis of his book and then we'll commence having our conversation. Thanks Jerry. Um, so it's really great to have these panelists because you know, in a book about that covers four billion years, we need a lot of uh, different expertise to get into all of this. And when I was writing the book, uh, the work that each of these people has done uh, comes into play because it's in part about the early history of life. And I consulted quite a bit with Carl on, uh, as I was trying to understand how single cells became multicellular organisms, and he was incredibly helpful for, for, uh, to me on that. Uh, Kristen's work on the um, cognitive construction of emotions is very consistent with the kinds of ideas that I'm interested in. Um, and I also am a, a very good friend and collaborator with uh, David Rosenthal here, who has uh, is the, the grandfather, the, the main god of uh, higher order theory of consciousness, which I also um, mostly subscribe to. I uh, have my own version of it. but um, So um, it's, it's a real pleasure to have all these folks here and to be able to interact with them. So let me just tell you a little bit about the book. Um, um, if you know anything about my research, you know that I study a part of the brain called the amygdala and its role in threat detection and responding to danger. And I've done that for, I don't know, 30 or something, 30 something years, maybe 40 years, I don't even know anymore. Um, and so at one point I started um, thinking about something, which is that the molecules that we've discovered in the rat brain that are important for the um, uh, detection, learning about danger and responding to danger, are also the molecules that are present in bees and flies and snails and other organisms like that. Um, so Eric Kandel's work, for example, in discovering all of these molecules was very influential uh, and helpful because those of us studying mammals would have a much harder time doing that. So we used the clues that Eric and his colleagues discovered. And I was talking to one of his colleagues once about, you know, what, how do these things come together. How do flies and bees and slugs have the molecules that we end up having as well? And of course it has to do with there being a common ancestor uh, that had all of these molecules. So if you think about that, we get, you know, that takes us somewhere around 630 million years ago. So it goes back a long time. And this fellow, his name is Seth Grant, who we tried to get to come to the panel. Um, uh, he's in Scotland, but, and he would, he would have loved to have come, uh, but he had a conflict, uh, so we weren't able to add him in the extra seat here. But Seth's work is on the genetic mechanisms of memory, and the genes in particular underlying certain kinds of receptors that are important in plasticity. And Seth had found these, that these molecules not only are present in mammals and invertebrates, but also in organisms like uh, jellyfish and snails and slugs, I'm sorry, jellyfish and uh, 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 sponges. And uh, so we're now talking about the beginning of animal life but he also noted that they're present in protozoa. Now, protozoa are single-cell organisms that are able to learn and 
you know, they're able to detect danger, respond to danger in their environment, incorporate nutrients, balance fluids, and use behavior to do all these things. They also reproduce. They, they, the protos, the protist, which the protozoa are part of, are the, uh, are the beginning of sexual reproduction. So a single cell, how does a single cell reproduce? Well, sometimes it's self-fertilization, but other times there are male and female cells that will fertilize, the male will fertilize the female. Um, so we're, we're now going back about, I don't know, two billion years or so to get to where we still have these molecules that are present in us. Now these animals, these organisms don't even have a nervous system. So what are they doing with learning and uh, uh, plasticity molecules? There's nothing to, to be plastic about. So um, the point is that you don't need a nervous system for behavior and you don't even need it for learning. And that's kind of a mind blowing concept. And so if you keep going back, and I kept going back until I got the, the, to the beginning of time, to the beginning of uh, the time of life, which is about some, somewhere around 3.7 billion years ago, 4 billion years ago, where the first cells that were able to successfully reproduce and con continue to reproduce so that the rest of life then followed. Um, these were bacterial-like cells um, that uh, also had to do these same things, detect danger, responded to uh, uh, detect danger, incorporate nutrients, balance fluids, reproduce, and things like that. And they use behavior for many of these things. So when we, we think about these in humans, we're talking about danger, we're talking about fear. Uh, incorporating nutrients, we're talking about feeding and hunger. Balancing fluids, we talk about thirst. Reproduction, we talk about sex and pleasure. But these mental states have nothing to do with why these behaviors exist. They exist because they were necessary for these early bacterial cells to survive in their environment. Behavior is a tool of survival, not a tool of the mind. We use behavior with our minds, but most of our mental capacities uh, do not necessarily impact our behavior. So for example, in the work I do on the amygdala and threat detection in rats and in people, we often hear the amygdala is the brain's fear center. That's absolutely wrong. The amygdala detects and responds to danger. Your fear, as Kristen will talk about, is a cognitive construction interpretation of what's going on around you. It's not simply a, a, a bottom-up thing that you turn on the amygdala and all of a sudden, bam, you're afraid. No, the, the fear is what happens when you realize what's going on. So you jump back from a bus flying across Second Avenue here and you do the jumping back long before you feel any kind of fear. Your brain is able to keep you alive because it has survival talents. And that's really what we are, survival machines. And we use our, our greatest capacities, such as consciousness and so forth, to uh, help us survive as well. And then that's an unusual thing in the history of life, that we can anticipate the future and use our understanding of what's going on in order to keep us alive. Now, our conscious minds are perhaps our greatest talent, but they're also our worst, uh, per, they have, they're responsible for our worst proclivities, greed, anger, envy, narcissism, and all of the things that uh, are getting us into trouble today uh, and potentially preventing the future survival of our species. You know, we're kind of, I think maybe Carl can address this more accurately, but species have a kind of uh, typical time course, and I think we're probably pretty close to the end of ours. The only way we can get past that, I think, would be if, as a species, we come together and use our collective conscious minds to do something good for the survival of our kind. So that's, uh, that kind of takes you from the beginning of the book to the end, and I guess we can throw it open to a conversation now. That's great. Well, uh, as someone who's read through Joe's, Joe's book, I can tell you it's just wonderful uh, magisterial, and, all the, and you can imagine four billion years is a lot of time to cover, and he covers it beautifully. I guess there's so many places to jump in and have a conversation about the contents of the book, but I think maybe we should start at the beginning and talk a little bit about the evol or the development of behavior, because that's sort of a, uh, an interesting uh, entry point. Shall I do continue? Or this? Sure. Um, I mean, as I said, behavior is something that every organism does in some way, including plants, which Carl works on. Uh, a tree that is 
is uh, absorbing light might, uh, or certainly sunflowers are going to, you know, adapt to the, the light. The, the roots of plants will seek out minerals and, and uh, water. Um, and there, there are many things that, that plants do that are quite amazing behaviorally. Uh, and I think that that's actually kind of a hot topic now, plant behavior. We just have to be careful not to go too far when we overinterpret plant behavior in terms of mental states. And I'll just stop there and throw it open. Well, I would add that <clears throat> behavior probably should be viewed as an example of any kind of biological trait uh, that spans the continuum of the tree of life. Um, and if you look at its evolutionary history, even consciousness, you see that to one degree or another, it exists within every lineage of life, including plants and bacteria. Um, but it is elaborated progressively with the appearance of new evolutionary groups. And you see that it becomes more elaborated as you go from unicellular to multicellular. And in multicellular um, animals, for example, it becomes more elaborate from those lineages that lack a central nervous system to those that do. Now, even though one can look at it as a continuum through the tree of life, that doesn't mean that it doesn't have discernible thresholds. So the analogy that I would give is if you look at the visible electromagnetic spectrum, light, and you see that the wavelengths go from blue to red in increments of one wavelength, you still nonetheless see the different colors of the rainbow. And so those are the thresholds. And so we can say, for example, in lineage A, mm, we're not sure that there's a level of consciousness. But when you get to, let's say, homo sapiens and primates, um, yes, consciousness um, appears to be the most elaborate. So as again, there's this continuum, and, but there are these increments that when you go from one wavelength to the next, you go from orange to yellow or yellow to orange light. Carl, could I ask you to talk briefly about um, the importance of genetic compa compatibility of the cells within an organism and what was required to create a multicellular organism with all the cells having the same genetic compatibility? <laughs> Okay, very briefly. Um, <laughs> so if we look at the fossil record, and I brought a prop, which maybe I'll discuss in a little minute, um, we see that every lineage plant animal begins as a unicellular ancestral form. And then if we look at the progressive evolution, we see that we go generally to colonial, and then to simple multicellular, and then to complex multicellular organisms. So the theory is that there are two very critical stages. The first is um, a stage in which the unicellular to colonial has to have genetic compatibility amongst adjoining cells. Just maybe explain colonial. Uh, the so a colonial organism would be something like a sponge. So you have a bunch of aggregated cells that are to some extent, cooperating and behaving, behaving in, a, in a collaborative way. Um, if I was talking about plants, I would be talking about uh, some kind of alga that is just a glob of cells glued together by an extracellular matrix. Um, but those cells have to be at least initially genetically compatible. And so it's comparatively easy to do that uh, in the sense that when a cell divides, it's Derivative cells are very, very similar genetically. And so there's this gemütlichkeit, this community structure uh, that's established. But then the really difficult stage is this second stage where you go from cells that are cooperating to cells that have now exported their fitness. So in other words, the survival of the multicellular organism doesn't depend on the survival of the individual cells. It depends on the reproductive success of the multicellular entity. 
And that's a very difficult thing to achieve. Nevertheless, if you look at the fossil record, multicellularity has evolved at a minimum of 27 independent evolutionary events. And it all started with something like this. This, this is a fossil which I'll pass around, but don't cut yourself. Okay? Um, this rock is 2.6 billion years old. It's an example of a thing called a stromatolite. Uh, it's uh, minerals that were precipitated by a bacterial biofilm. And inside this are microfossils, which are visible when you take thin sections and look at them through the microscope. Now, if I was alive back then, 2.6 billion years, I would still see things that perhaps I would identify as behavior, because these biofilm organisms are collaborating. Um, some of them are doing one function, another, another function. Uh, but getting them all to collaborate as a single multicellular organism, that's a very complicated thing. So if you'd like to pass this around, just don't cut yourself on the edges. It's sharp. So one of the ideas I end up with at the end of the book, and it's kind of a crazy idea, but anyway, um, is that the human capacity for self-awareness is uh, results in our brain having a rogue component that is different from anything else that has existed in a multicellular organism, which is the ability to go against the will or the, the, the good, the greater good of all of the other cells of the body and end your own life. Uh, and I think that that doesn't exist in any other organism. You have to be able to, to know you exist, to know that an end can exist, and to choose to bring that in to fruition. So it, that was one of the most amazing things. And many, I discovered many amazing things reading Carl's work and other um, really deep biological thinkers on these topics. But one of the things that stuck with me was the compatibility of a, an organism, and to have an organism that has many cells, all of the cells have to work towards the purpose of the organism to stay alive. And that's why, you know, unlike in a colony where you can remove a cell or a cell can, can uh, defect and live on its own because it's not dependent on the, the colony. It helps the colony if the cell is there, so the colony needs to protect some way from the cells defecting. But in, if we remove a skin cell or any other cell from our body, the cell dies because we have so many different parts of our body that are interdependent. Our circulatory system depends on our respiratory system and, and so on. So it's just a, a, a multicellular organism is just a fascinating thing, and I thank you for every uh, thing I learned from your work. So maybe, David, we could talk about consciousness uh, a bit. Well, I was going to ask you a question in what you just said about this suicide thing. Yeah. Uh, if the animal, a human, uh, thinks, well, this is a good idea, I'm going to end my life, and it goes ahead and does that, why, I mean, there are all sorts of psychological things that uh, I'm not competent to say anything about. Uh, and, but as, let's assume that we have a case of a person who decides, I'm going to end my life. And it's actually from the point of view of the person's psychological functioning, uh, that's a good thing. Uh, why is this going against the rest of, I mean... Because it's a, the rest of the body doesn't want to die. Its purpose is to keep on living. Well, the rest of the body is doing whatever it does as long as the animal is alive. But you have uh, one part of the animal, one small part of the animal, that is making a decision for the rest of the body. Normally, the body is working as a unit. Well... So if I'm a tiger and I see prey over there and I say, I'm hungry, I'm going to go kill the prey and eat the prey, uh, this is my psychological functioning uh, that's driving the rest of my limbs and my mouth and all of this stuff. 
I wouldn't so, make it psychological, but... <laughs> I'm sorry? I wouldn't make it psychological. I would say that it's the survival imperative of the organism to do that. I mean, there may be some psychology uh, that goes with it, but I don't think that's necessarily what's driving the behavior. Uh, so w w when you talk about psychology, uh, it's uh, got to be conscious? Mm. I, I was assuming that uh, what happens... Um, above the neck, uh, so to speak. That's going to be psychological in general. Our medulla is causing us to breathe and causing our heart to... I don't think we can take everything in the brain as psychological. Well, I was being a little loose that way, okay. but in any case, uh, the brain is not asking the kidneys or uh, the feet or any other part of the body uh, about this business of going over and killing the prey and eating it, uh, the brain is driving the rest of the body. So maybe there's a smaller piece of the brain that says, uh, I know what, I've been around long enough, I'm going to put an end to all of this. Uh, it, it seems to be a continuity uh, between the brain running the body uh, for killing prey and but eating My point them. was that, that, as you said, it's not a small, I wouldn't say a small piece, but there's one component of the brain's capacity that is making a decision that is going to terminate the activity of everything else. It's not, whereas biologically, organisms are designed, well, not designed, but are built to, uh, so that they can persist. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I would. Um, I'm a plant person, so a lot of the examples that I can give are probably very alien uh, because plants are not alive. At least a lot of people don't view them as living organisms. But anyway, I can think of a few examples uh, amongst plants where the entire organism essentially commits suicide. But in each case, it's for reproduction. So the sunflower, for example, a lot of uh, aquatic plants will reproduce once. And when they reproduce once, they will divert all of their energy from the somatic non-reproductive cells. They'll divert all of their resources into perpetuating and as close as it can, ensuring the survival of its progeny. So that is one word that comes to my mind is it's an example of altruism. It's not saying I'm tired of living, I don't want to live. In fact, it's um, committing the ultimate Darwinian self-sacrifice for the fitness of the next generation. Um, and it, but it's a... I wouldn't say decision, but a, it's a, a process of the yes. entire organism. It's actually it's genetically organic. programmed. Right. It's genetic. So uh, I don't know. I, I'm not going to use the word consciousness, but right. it's certainly behavioral. The purpose of the brain is to regulate the body and to ensure our survival. And so it is, it, it is odd for a human to sort of override that process. In the case of plants, they're... You know, ensuring the longevity of the, the extended organism, right? right? The sociologist uh, Emil Durkheim um, had an interesting discussion of all of this, and you know, this is where I'm getting this idea of the, um, uh, the human being the only organism that intentionally terminates itself. Um, you know, when you, when you mentioned, um, Carl, the, the development of multicellularity and how now the Sim the, these cells with similar genetic endowment um, now have, as you said, they've exported their fitness. And uh, this may sound like it's a digression, but I think it is related to what we're talking about now. And so does that make rubbish of the selfish gene notion? And, and I mention it in the context of, well, are there d d d directives, let's call them, from nature that are at odds with one another. In this case, you see it, they may, they may line up differently depending on whether it's a unicellular or a colonial yeah. versus a multicellular organism. Well, if you read Dawkins very carefully, the selfish gene, um, he's really not saying the gene is in control. 
um, he's been interpreted to really push that point of view. And later on in his subsequent publications, he kind of has. But in that book, he really is um, talking about the emergent properties from the level of the genome, from the genetic structure. And we know that genetic structure does not directly map to the phenotype, to the appearance of the organism. When I was a student at CCNY, I was taught, well, DNA, messenger RNA, protein. We didn't know about alternative splicing. We didn't know about intrinsically disordered proteins. We didn't know about gene silencing. We didn't know about epigenetics. What we do know now is you cannot directly map the genotype to the phenotype. And so this selfish gene, the way it's been interpreted in the popular literature, is rubbish. <laughs> Well, the idea of the fitness being exported, which I think is a wonderful phrase, I'm going to latch onto that, it, may, it makes it seem, well, that's now the, the element that gets affected by natural selection. Yes. And it's some slightly more abstract sort of thing, concept. Well, right? I mean, if you talk about the export of fitness, what you're really saying is the fitness of the organism does not depend on the number of times individual cells divide. It depends on the number of times the multicellular organism reproduces. So if you cut off your arm, which is not suicide, by accident, all those cells are dead. But that's irrelevant. Their fitness has nothing to do with the individual's capacity to reproduce and produce progeny. So that's one way of thinking about the export of fitness. It's a major, major transition in every evolutionary lineage that's achieved complicated multicellularity. So whereas there are instances of, say, uh, for example, uh, programmed death, like an apoptosis, and you mentioned the example of the plant, I think, Joe, what you're talking about it still is something different. Uh, this sort of, I have a, uh, a, 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 a there's a, a meaning behind my act to end my life, which uh, it seems to be in a different, it's a different sort of concept, right? It's, it's sort of risen out of the sort of uh, lower, lower level biological functions that might include program death. It's a higher order thought. <laughs> right? Well, I think, so uh, Joe is alluding to uh, my theory of consciousness. The, the theory of consciousness is basically uh, along very common sense lines, I think. Uh, if you're in some, some type of psychological state, uh, the state counts as conscious only if you're aware of being in that state. Uh, and that seems natural because if somebody, if we have evidence that somebody is in a certain psychological state and the person says, no, I'm not, uh, I don't feel that way, I don't see the stimulus, I don't have that thought, I don't have that desire, whatever it may be. That's evidence that the, the but we still have evidence that the person is in the state, uh, and it's possible under all these, the conditions that I just mentioned, to have such evidence. Then we have a case uh, of, a, we have a clear case of an unconscious mental state. So uh, that pretty much implies that what it is for a state to be conscious is for the individual to be aware of it in some way or another. And what I've argued is, uh, um, going again from the human case uh, here, though, uh, unlike Joe, I think I would uh, move down to non-linguistic animals. Uh, but in the human case, uh, the standard thing is that if I'm in a mental state that I am aware of, I can tell you that. And if I tell you that, <coughs> that's performing a speech act, I'm saying something, I'm expressing a thought that I'm in that state. Uh, so the way that I'm aware of being in the state is by having a thought about it. That's basically the theory. And uh, as Joe mentioned, he uh, likes the theory, he has a, 
slightly different version of it. Only slightly. Uh, but, um, um, so I, I'd just like to add one thing to, to what you said, which is that, you know, a lot of people think I say that animals don't have consciousness, but I don't say that. I say that we don't know what they have. Right. Precisely because they can't tell us. Um, and we can't use behavior as a reliable indicator of what an animal is experiencing. For example, this has been attempted in the area of emotion with uh, the amygdala and fear. We assume that because a rat and a person both freeze to danger, and in both, the, in both cases the amygdala is required to freeze to danger, that that must mean that the, uh, the rat and the person both feel fear and that the rat feels fear because the person feels fear and they're both using the amygdala. But the assumption is wrong. That, you know, our, often when we are running from a bear, we are afraid. But that doesn't mean that fear is what causes us to run. They're not the same thing. Those are correlations, not causation. Every scientist is taught from day one to not confuse correlation and causation. And yet, we've been kind of seduced by this correlation to think that if an animal or a person is responding to danger, it must be because they're afraid. But when we look in the brain and start trying to analyze how fear is coming about, we see that there are people who have damage to the amygdala uh, that under some conditions can still report fear. So uh, also, if we present stimuli to a person subliminally, so the person, that means a very quick flash, for example, that means the person doesn't know the stimulus is there, uh, doesn't report feeling any fear, but the amygdala is activated, the heart is racing, palms are sweating. So the responses are there, but fear is not what's driving them. That doesn't mean fear is irrelevant, it's just not what the amygdala is doing. So we have to look elsewhere for where the, uh, the amygdala might, or where fear may be coming from. And building on, on your theory, I and others have uh, talked about high order states involving prefrontal cortex. In fact, you and Hakwan Lao have written about right. prefrontal cortex. So <clears throat> let me just say a couple of words about prefrontal cortex. Um, there are different parts of, of the prefrontal cortex, one of which has properties that are only found in the human brain, and this is called the frontal pole. Now, there are other parts of the prefrontal cortex, for example, the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, that are only found in primates, including other humans. And this has also been actually implicated in consciousness in humans. So I'm willing to say, yes, probably other primates, because they have this part of the brain, could very well have some kind of awareness but an awareness that is made possible by that kind of prefrontal cortex as opposed to the other kind. So my idea would be that the, these uh, dorsolateral regions shared by all primates are involved in a kind of knowledge of what's there, whereas the frontal pole, for reasons I won't go into other than the, that it's relatively unique in humans, uh, might be involved in the ability to know that it's you that is aware of what's there. So the, that extra higher order thought that that, that awareness that you have, it's definitely worth pursuing in terms of this frontal pole. We don't have an answer to this question yet, but in, in your paper with Hakwan Lao in 2011, right. you mentioned the frontal pole, and that's really how I got onto the frontal pole, so thank you. <laughs> but now if we go to other mammals, there are a bunch of uh, prefrontal regions um, that are present in these animals, but on the medial side of the uh, hemisphere, inside the, the, we have the two hemispheres of the hot dog bun, and we spread them apart. So the white, untoasted part would be where the medial areas are. And these where you are. Put the mustard. Yeah, but, yeah, and the bun, and the dog, yeah. <laughs> uh, or ketchup. But the uh, so these other these other mammals have these, these medial prefrontal areas, and this may allow a kind of body awareness that is another level down, uh, that beyond that knowledge that, you know, that uh, they, they understand what's out there, and beyond their knowledge that they know that it's them that's having that state. So I allow for all these things, I just don't know how we would test it. Um, so then, he, here's the thing, uh, th there's an experiment that Alan Cowley and Petra Sturig did with uh, <coughs> some macaque monkeys. Um, uh, so blindsight is a condition uh, where uh, some area 
of uh, primary visual cortex is ablated or uh, damaged and doesn't function. Uh, and if a person with blind sight is presented with a stimulus that goes to that area of um, uh, primary visual cortex, uh, the person will say, I don't see anything. Uh, on the other hand, the person will be able to guess uh, if the experimenter presses uh, the person to guess. You, you say, well, <coughs> guess about what the nature of the um, uh, uh, stimulus was uh, that you're saying you didn't see. And uh, the subject will say, well, I can't guess. I didn't see anything. Please just guess. And they get it more or less around 83% of the time correct, which is very good. Uh, and um, there, there, there have been a number of uh, uh, human subjects of this sort, and the results are pretty constant. Uh, so what um, um, Cowie and Sturig did uh, was to surgically ablate, uh, I think it was the right side, uh, well, the, 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 left, uh, the left side of primary visual cortex will see the right field, the, the right visual field. Um, and they had a monkey that uh, in two separate experiments uh, uh, performed as follows. Uh, the monkey was able to reach out and touch something in the right visual field, uh, even though that's, that's the blind sight area for that monkey. Then, several months later, the monkey was trained uh, to distinguish between a stimulus in the left side and a blank. So, if there's something, uh, you press it. If it's a blank, you press another button, which is the blank button. And then it turned out that this monkey uh, would press the blank button uh, for a stimulus in the right side. <laughs> uh, so the monkey is able to do pretty much what a human can do. That is to say, uh, in a certain way, the monkey is able to guess that there is something there. And the monkey also says, I don't see anything. And it seems to me that it's hard to explain that pair of results without assuming uh, that the monkey has blind sight. That is to say that there's a difference for the monkey between seeing and consciously seeing. So I'll just refer to Larry, what Larry Weisskrantz said about that, which is that, yes, it looks like they're seeing, but because it's an animal we can't. Larry Weisskrantz is the person who discovered blind sight and has popularized it, and also invented these commentary keys that Cowie and Stewart were, were using. Larry said, we, we think that the animal is conscious, but we simply don't know scientifically. You know, that there's no proof. So Larry was the one who told me about this particular experiment first. I know, but in print and, he said that. <laughs> right. And in, in conversation, he told me right. he thinks this is evidence. Right. Uh, and well, it, it's, a, it's, it, it's a finding, Joe, that I think is hard to explain <laughs> any other way. So I'm not, uh, I'm not one, questioning. One, I'm just saying. Cast you, around for a hypothesis. Uh, what's the hypothesis that would explain uh, the fact that the monkey can actually detect, uh, but the monkey uh, presses the blank button for a stimulus on that side. I'm willing to admit it's possible. I'm sorry? I'm willing to admit it's possible. Well, but the other explanation would be that there's some sort of disposition to act that doesn't necessarily include what we often refer to as consciousness, right? Isn't that? Yeah, yeah I mean, I mean, even I don't know what that is exactly. Just, but yeah, but, but sure what I'm asking for that. an explanation of is yeah. the pair of results. Yeah, that right, is to right, say, right. why? Why is it? I mean, so if a stimulus is presented on the left side, yeah. uh, the monkey presses the stimulus where the stimulus is on the screen. Right. Uh, I, if no stimulus on the left side, presses blank, right? And if a stimulus on the right side, presses blank. Right. Uh, and so that's one kind of experiment. And the other kind of experiment is that uh, the monkey can actually detect it. So it seems as though uh, there's a distinction between 
the ability to detect, which I'm suggesting corresponds to a human's guessing, on the one hand, and the monkey's counting it as a blank, mm -hmm. whatever it means for a blank. Uh, blank means I don't see anything. Yeah. I'm not sure if this is relevant, and please, I'm apologizing. I'm speaking as a botanist. Um, but I think it was philosopher Ned Block that made the difference between um, the phenomenology of responding and receiving signals and the phenomenology of being aware of those signals. And so I'd like to point out that plants, uh, which lack a neurological system, but nevertheless have an electrical signaling system within them, clearly perceive external stimuli and respond to them adaptively. So that's kind of a phenomenological awareness. But it's by no means self-awareness. There's no reflection uh, as we might uh, project from our own experiences. So this thing called consciousness is a touchy subject. I'm not sure. I think it was John Locke who actually used the word consciousness for the first time. I think it was Descartes. David. Was it? Well, I, Locke said consciousness is what happens in man's mind. And that was the definition, um, not that definitions are holding. But I would just say that this, um, there's one attribute that I think defines all forms of life. And when I was a young person, oh God, not only a century ago, but a millennium ago, the biology book said life is defined by irritability. <laughs> and then you read on and it Sorry, says... <laughs> And as I get older, I become more irritable. But uh, what, it, what it was really saying was that <laughs> life responds. It reacts to external stimuli. And I think that is from bacteria all the way up to us. But this thing about consciousness being self-awareness, as I have to agree, I'm not sure that any primate other than us has been shown to be truly self-aware. I, I think in your book, Joe, you do spend a lot of time trying to push back against certain intuitions. Even you criticize Darwin for this in a way, mm -hmm. for adapting, uh, adopting anthropomorphism, maybe prematurely, or as you say, prematurely. Um, I think it's, uh, it's such a woolly uh, concept, uh, consciousness, because we also mean slightly different things and we use it in different sentences, for example. But I'm interested in the, 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 the famous story about running from a bear, because I think where you might also lose some of your audience is that it would seem to me whatever impels me to start running when I see a bear, at some point along the line, especially if I think about it you know, hypothetically, I get fearful, mm -hmm. right? So, you, and I, I can imagine even in the, in the uh, actual event of running away, halfway down the Whatever it is, it's not a block, I guess, if I'm near a bear. But well, you are fearful, but the yeah. question is, is your fear the cause? Right, right, exactly, right. So at some point, it certainly kicks in. Right. That's for sure. Maybe Kristen. Right. Yeah. yeah, I mean, in the history of the study of emotion, there's a, a, a tradition of assuming that there's some centrally organized state that is causing behaviors, and you see that as far back as Plato, right? And um, Darwin was certainly guilty of this and perhaps is the one who has sort of ushered that idea into to modern, modern science. Um, and yet, behaviors are often emerging more quickly than conscious experiences. Mm -hmm. And so, the brain is perceiving behaviors as they're unfolding, it's perceiving stimuli in the world around it, it's uh, perceiving visceromotor changes in the body and is categorizing those experiences, but uh, there's not clear evidence that there is some centralized mechanism that is fear, per se, that is causing a certain suite of behaviors, or anger, per se, that's causing a sort of, sort of uh, suite of behaviors. Yeah, I was just thinking about how, when you're addressing people and trying to explain that, there's such a tremendous pushback because our conscious, you know, uh, deliberations about these episodes so strongly inserts 
fear. That's right. right, right. But, you know, if all we needed was intuition, we wouldn't have to do experiments. <laughs> right. Science would be irrelevant. So, I mean, intuition is often the starting point of an experiment, some scientific endeavor. We're all, you know, we live in our heads, we live in our folk psychology, and this is why we do psychology and want to understand how it all works. But ultimately, we have to get to what's going on in terms of how these processes really work. And what I've tried to argue is that the um, processes that control these innate behaviors, like freezing or escape, uh, are separate from those that are making us feel fear. And I think this is consistent with Kristen's uh, work as well. You know, it's the um, we're we're innately anthropomorphic. I mean, it's been said that anth anthropomorphism was very useful to our early ancestors, as they you know, living with cows and uh, creating farming and agriculture. It was helpful to treat animals as little people or big people, depending on the animal, uh, that, you know, because they were partners in, in this process. Maybe not equal partners, I mean, not that one got a eaten and the other didn't. But, um, um, and so something could be innate in our brain and yet not be scientifically correct, mm -hmm. because it's not about whether it's scientifically accurate, it's about whether it was useful to our species. So, you know, I say this almost every lecture I give. I go home, I pet my cat, he purrs, and I think he's happy. You don't have to be a scientist every moment of your waking life. <laughs> it's, right. Science is um, a different thing than life. Yeah. We, you know, we lead our lives in ways, and sometimes science is useful in leading our lives. But certainly um, it's not a way to, if you, had, if you didn't have another hat, you could never have a pet if you were, you know, a materialist scientist like me. Right. I would argue that we're not just innately anthropomorphic, but we innately uh, assign agency to things. And right. so we infer intention from behaviors because it's a useful shortcut cognitively. And therefore, we are likely to infer intention in other people's behaviors, in animals' behaviors, in natural events, mm -hmm. in ways that they don't actually exist. Cartoon characters. Right. So then plants. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the one advantage to being a botanist is that your study organisms don't bleed um, on you. Uh, and the other is that it's almost impossible to project human emotions when you're looking at an organism. I think some people do that. Though. Well, <laughs> yes, but uh, as a scientist who okay. studies yeah. plants, yeah. I, I, I have no fear about projecting uh, human emotions or, or attributes to plants. Now, wh what about does this make then rubbish of the Turing test? You know, what? Well, the idea that we anthropomorphize. So, like, so um, Alan Turing, right, said famously that if you know if you're interacting with a computer program and you can't tell the difference about whether it's uh, a conscious being or not, then it's conscious. So this line of argument would suggest that's just totally wrong. Well, can't I think be. Turing's idea is uh, that Turing imagined that. Uh, Turing was considering whether you could have a computer program that would be as elaborate and flexible as a person would be. Uh, so that's not, oh, I think, uh, along the lines of anthropomorphizing uh, an elephant or a palm tree uh, so much as... Right, but he's relying on the notion of an acceptable anthropomorphization as a criterion for consciousness. Well, so, he's relying on he's relying on a particular hypothesis yeah. uh, that humans are able to react uh, in a conversational setting like this uh, in marvelously flexible, unpredictable ways, and that uh, so some very smart programmer. He was a very smart programmer. Uh, uh, might be able to design a program right. so that uh, a very smart psychologist right. wouldn't be able to tell whether um, a program was behind yeah. the screen or a person was right, behind right. the screen. The person was typing out answers, yeah. right? And um, so it's a particular hypothesis about, I think, the nature of human thinking rather than something having to do with anthropomorphizing. 
a thought that has occurred to me while listening to this is, and it's a question I'm not sure anyone's really ever asked, is when does the individual human being become conscious? Oh, we, <laughs> has it, well, I mean, we start out as a fertilized egg, a zygote, we go through the blastula, gastrula, embryological modifications. Right, but the point is, the point is that um, that's the same organism throughout its ontogeny. Sure. And this attribute that we call consciousness makes its an appearance at some stage in that ontogenetic yeah. sequence. So it's fair to say that we're not conscious throughout our entire embryology yeah. or in most many, of our life. Every or day. most of our life. It happens every day. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. so I think that it's worth making a few distinctions. Good. Uh, one distinction, uh, we, we, we use the word conscious <coughs> to distinguish between the way we all are now here and uh, when we're asleep or knocked out or anesthetized or something like that. So uh, that's one kind of consciousness uh, that has to do uh, with something like biological functioning. Uh, we also use the word conscious, uh, so I'm conscious of a table, I'm conscious of a water bottle, I'm con so, uh, and it might be uh, that the psychological state, the visual state in virtue of which I'm aware of the table in front of me is an unconscious visual state, uh, one of these subliminal states. Uh, so if you say, well, David, is there a table in front of you? I would say, no, there isn't. Uh, but then uh, if, if you ran some tests, like priming tests or force choice or whatever, uh, you would be able to see, actually, I was seeing the table. So I was conscious of the table, but not consciously conscious. Yeah. Uh, and uh, sometimes this appears in the popular press uh, as a distinction between being aware of the table and being consciously aware of the table. Well, my, and people my, seem to be able to... My question gets back to this. So to, but there, then there are the, these three things that developmentally will emerge right. at some point uh, with, uh, uh, with an animal's development. My statement actually was meant to pro to provoke that kind of response, oh. but also but also to point out that it, not that I'm heckle saying that ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny, but it's kind of interesting that when you look at the tree of life from unicellular to multicellular, from simple multicellular to complicated multicellular, from early primates to late primates, of which we're the most recent example, um, the question, <laughs> maybe the last, uh, the question is when does it make its appearance that we would say this thing is self-conscious? Oh, and so, and that, that, that's, that's even beyond yeah, what I yeah. was talking about because, uh, so uh, if we're talking about the difference between uh, seeing something consciously and seeing it subliminally, uh, that's not a matter of self-consciousness. Uh, that's something more primitive. Uh, and then uh, Joe talks in the book a fair amount about this, uh, uh, he uses this notion that he borrows from Endel Tolving about autonoetic consciousness. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not completely comfortable with uh, the distinction between autonoetic consciousness and noetic consciousness, but it, at least so, so, something that involves reflective awareness of mm. the self is a more advanced uh, stage of development mm -hmm. uh, than simply consciously seeing. So Michael Lewis, who's a developmental psychologist, has written a book called The uh, Dawn of Consciousness or something like that, I forget exactly the title. And then that he proposes that um, the child becomes conscious in an adult kind of sense um, with the development of personal pronouns around the age of two or three. So that you now have something to hang your, your understanding of who you are, I, me, mine. And, you know, it's not that the child was, you know, asleep all that time, but didn't have a sense of me 
the way you have when you have a concept. And I, I think maybe Kristen can say a lot about concepts and emotions and consciousness and so forth. Yeah, so there's a lot of developmentalists who argue that uh, self-awareness in children emerges around two or three, around or 18 months around the time that they can identify themselves from other individuals mm. via this mirror self-recognition task. So you put a dot on the child's head and you make them look in the mirror and instead of touching the other baby in the mirror, they touch their, their own forehead. Um, and it's thought that that is an indication of, of the self. Um, but the self, like any concept is is a concept um, that uh, is accumulated over time, that um, you are you and you have certain features and certain likes, likes and certain dislikes. Um, and it's clear that that's something that emerges over, over toddlerhood. Um, but your comment was, was interesting regarding ontogeny as it um, sort of recapitulates the, the phylogeny that Joe um, outlines in the book, because it is this, this gradual process, right? And we, there's an urge to um, infer these stages at which there's shifts, yeah. um, and it, it's much more complicated than that. Yeah, I'll go back to that analogy that I made with visible light when you break it up with a spectrum that, you know, you go from one frequency to the next, click, 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 you go from red to blue, and in between are all the colors of the rainbow, and there are demonstrable thresholds when we would all agree this is yellow, this is orange, this is green, and yet it's a continuum mm -hmm. as a process, which to me is rather interesting, even from an evolutionary point of view, because as you probably all aware there's an argument between saltational evolution and gradualistic evolution and I don't see them as necessarily mutually exclusive by virtue of that analogy that I can get um, you know go from a fish to a terrestrial thing or an amphibian and that doesn't mean that I had to go through a massive reorganization uh, of the body structure of the organism. You know that analogy really have answers a question I was about to pose, um, doesn't completely answer I think, but that is, I think what an amazing uh, sort of a, a miracle or a mystery it is that we all pass through this developmental stage when we're unconscious and become conscious. And then likewise, every day, there are lots of instances where we're self-aware or not self-aware. Um, I'm thinking of the example of driving in the car and some room that you're very, you know, and then you suddenly realize, where's my mind been all this time, even though obviously you're responding to the thing. but. The, I think, well, that's an amazing miracle. Why can't we pinpoint it? Why can't we say, well, that's, aha, that's where I became conscious, because we don't, and we don't know that. But it's interesting that the, the analogy with the color spectrum is because, you know, there are those oddball colors between yellow and orange, let's say, or, or blue and purple, where we might stop and think, oh, I don't know where the line is here. I'm not sure where the line is, right? And that may be some, I don't know, I'm putting it out there as a possible uh, 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 analogy to our difficulty knowing when we're fully conscious or not. You know? Coming it's back even more to complicated that. in terms of emotions. I mean, we have these specific words that we use and um, uh, you know, but the gradations are not so clear. And Kristen, you've done a lot of work on mo emotion words and also in terms of culture, and maybe you could Yeah, I was actually going to start that off with the, the color analogy, um, which is interesting because it turns out that there are actually cultural differences in where people see cut points in mm -hmm. the visible uh, spectrum of light. And, you know, there's hot debate surrounding this, um, but it, it does seem that, you know, even within a culture, people disagree on where, you know, where the categories begin and end. Um, and certainly across cultures, people disagree about where color categories begin and end. Now, if that's the case for color, emotion is much more complicated. Um, and uh, there, much of my work uh, has shown that the emotion words that people know and acquire through their culture, name um, rich sets of categories that help people to parcelate the, the world into emotional meaning. And so uh, the richer your emotion vocabulary, the uh, more likely you are to see instances of these categories in the world around you. And so in that sense, to come full circle to the point about language, Humans may have a unique form of consciousness that is predicated on their ability to use language, which 
essentially warps perceptual space. Um, it makes certain things look more similar together uh, to one another and certain things look more distinct from one another. And that's not to say that animals don't have complex representations, but um, the question then becomes one of gradation again, right? So to the extent that animals have the ability to represent these rich caches of knowledge in an abstract way, um, they may or may not have emotion concepts that, that look something like humans. You know, I think it's interesting that we can translate a word like fear across languages, but obviously we know that there are cultural differences in, in the experience of these things. But we assume because we have the same word, we're all experiencing the same thing. And this is you know, a huge problem in um, geopolitical politics where yeah. we, take, we take the translation literally, but it means X to the people who are listening to the translation and Y to the people from, from whom the translation is coming from. So, I mean, words are our friend, but also can get us into trouble uh, with sloppy use. And I think scientists are often very sloppy with words. I have a, a person. difficulties happen even um, in very local context. Right. Yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, and very often because, you know, people are being nice, uh, they don't say anything about it or they may not notice it. Uh, but I don't think that you have to travel across national boundaries right. or la language <laughs> no, boundaries. Subcultures are just as bad. Yeah. You were going to say something? Oh, I was going to, a uh, personal example, uh, I was writing a book with a German colleague and we were working together week after week, a lot of math, and we decided that one day we would speak English and the next day we would speak German, so our brains didn't fry. And at one point, um, the day we spoke English, I'm trying to explain something to Christoph, and he said, nine, 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 that, that makes no sense. So I said it in German, he said, oh yeah. That <laughs> <laughs> now, Joe, Joe, in your book, you do make a very interesting introduction to this topic of deliberation. There's a chapter on that, and I think this goes back to maybe even the example with the monkeys, there's this... Uh, <coughs> I guess one, one thing that makes some of us believe that a, an animal might be conscious if they seem to deliberate, or at least they're conscious of themselves. I know the Stoic philosopher Chrysippus uh, mentioned that, uh, would describe how uh, animals, for example, who might be preparing to leap over a crevasse, will size up their ability to do it and seem to be in some way deliberating and aware and he, he uses it as a, he, he believes a demonstration that there's some degree of self-awareness, at least in that regard. I, I know how far I might be able to jump or not, and will I do it? And so sometimes the animal will back off, and sometimes the animal will leap. And uh, that's a very interesting challenge to the idea that animals aren't, con you know, aren't conscious. I mean, it's, I'm not saying I accept it, but I think it's think of, interesting sort of thing. Yeah, one of the um, points I tried to make about deliberation was that you have to distinguish conscious from non-conscious deliberation. So our cognitive capacities are, you know, a lot of what we do is done non-consciously. We make decisions all the time, and we may justify them after the fact consciously, but you know, in the process of making snap decisions, we're not like analyzing everything consciously. So the animal that's making that snap decision about whether to jump or not, uh, or maybe it's, you know, maybe it's not so snap, yeah. but you don't know that it's consciously exploring. It probably is. I'm not saying it's not. Right, right, yeah. But, it's yeah. an interesting challenge to the idea, because it just so much appears to be that. But you know, uh, I, I would add to the worry that sometimes, at least it seems to me, and other people that I talk to, uh, uh, what happens, well, I don't know whether to do A or B. And instead of being Aristotle and whatever Aristotle was saying about deliberating, which would be very conscious, uh, I turn my mind off, so to speak. Well, I don't turn my mind off, but I turn, I, I stop thinking about it consciously and I let it simmer. And, you know, it's going on somewhere, but I'm not paying any, oh, then I see things clearly. And so this is the unconscious processes 
that are doing the work. Which really are deliberative in many instances. Yes. Yeah. Uh, okay. I'm, I'm not suggesting that they aren't deliberative. Yeah. I'm suggesting that they aren't conscious. Right. And that, 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 that's, um, that, that we can't uh, extrapolate uh, from deliberation to consciousness. I agree. I agree with that. Uh, Joe may be familiar with this work, but there's evidence that um, you can look at cells uh, that map out space uh, in a non-human animal, and as the animal is preparing to behave, it's simulating which pathway it's going to take. And you can see that playing out in the, the firing of the cells, and then the question becomes, is that deliberation, right? So again, we need to be careful with our, with our definitions. It's amazing, whatever it is. <laughs> well, it's something like a decision-making process. Uh, so, was your worry about whether it's deliberation, whether it's conscious deliberation? I, I, I'm just pointing out again that it's slippery, right? Where yeah. where we begin to infer some sort of human-like state, right? Humans certainly deliberate by saying, okay. "Oh, should I take you know this route or this route?" Um, but if the if the animal brain is is simulating these future events and sort of weighing uh, which one to guide behavior, the question is: Is so that's that something where the, comparable? The whole, you know, space and place uh, cell and all that came from, from Tolman's observations that rats are deliberating as they go through a maze, and that was the mental modeling of the maze. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think, you know, there's a lot of stuff that happens outside of what we're thinking about. Plant roots are an example, actually. <clears throat> a number of measurements showing how roots penetrate the soil that the tips are the growing points of the root, and you will occasionally see the tip of the root stop growing. And yeah. it's sensing, and we know the mechanism, which is the weakest root, and that's the one it follows. So, yeah. you know, is that deliberation? But it's, it's certainly okay. perceiving nice. um, alternatives, and it adaptively takes yeah the easy way out, so to speak. So, Gerald, just to go back to the, um, you know, your question earlier about um, the hard sell, about that it's not fear that's causing us to, yeah. to respond this yeah. way. So, this is coming at it from a different angle, but this is your field in terms of psychopharmacology, and uh, so let me ask you a question. How would you evaluate current treatments, psychopharmacological treatments for uh, novel treatments for anxiety right now? Well, they haven't much evolved over the last, you know... Uh, 40 years? Yeah, 40 years, right. I guess, I'd say. Um, there... I guess it reminds me of your comment, you know, that people could not have an, amyl an amygdala and still have fear, you know? It's very difficult to pin down exactly the uh, conscious experience of fear. Uh, uh, but, you know, it's interesting, there are, there's some interaction between the sort of sheer physiological response, like, for example, in a panic attack, um, and the, and the uh, experience of avoidant behavior, right? Because we usually, in psychiatry, think, uh, we, we don't talk about fear, actually, as that much in right. the literature. I mean, usually, which is, is, a, is a shame. People, patients certainly do, but more avoidant behavior. And so um, most of the efforts are made to tamp down a lot of the physiological responses. Okay. And I think it was interesting, we'd spoken about Donald Klein earlier, who was the psychiatrist uh, recently passed away, who distinguished panic anxiety from sort of generalized anxiety. And he'd also discovered that the mipramine, which is one of the older antidepressants, seemed to work effectively for that and uh, was better than taking a benzodiazepine like Valium or Xanax, and that was a very interesting breakthrough because it did seem to create a very distinct and unanticipated uh, benefit from a class of drugs. There was no reason to think, uh, aside from what got Don thinking about it, no obvious reason to think that that would work, mm -hmm. but it, it, it does actually help. And there are a lot of theories about why that's so, but there is this sort of residual problem of patients going through this and still being uh, troubled by avoidant behavior. I mean, another example would be PTSD. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's very difficult to get people to, uh, despite all sorts of pharmacological and uh, behavioral treatments, 
uh, they succeed sometimes, of course, but th there's no you know, perfect solution to those things. Do you, uh, Danny Pine, a psychiatrist, and I wrote a paper a few years ago. I don't know if you... I know. So, yeah. so in this paper, we reviewed the um, uh, efforts to find medications and so forth to help people with problems of fear and anxiety, and I guess more anxiety than fear, because you, as you said, it's not as, fear is not talked about as much. Um, but one of the things that comes up is the fact that the pharmaceutical industry is getting out of the business of uh, developing new treatments. And the reason is because nothing has been discovered over the last 40 years, really. And so what we propose in this paper is the problem is not um, uh, with the studies that, that are being done, but with the interpretation that's being applied to them. Because the way the research is done is to work on, for example, avoidant behavior in rats or mice and to assume that that's going to make the person less fearful or anxious. But because the amygdala and these subcortical circuits that control those behaviors are not generating the fear and anxiety itself, the subjective experience, mm -hmm. uh, the, the, uh, the patients don't, quote, feel better. So the problem is that we've assumed that you have this fear center that can be targeted by a drug, and that if you change that fear center, the person is better. Mm -hmm. But that's not how it works. I mean, the, the subjective experience of the patient has to be an endpoint. And I think, um, I think yeah, this is not my field, but I'm, no, as no an way. outsider, right. it seems that subjective experience has been marginalized in the field, both in uh, cognitive therapy and in pharmaceutical therapy, as uh, a goal of the, of the whole process. Well, I'll say since we're sitting here at, uh, at Dipsy, you know, psychoanalysts don't do, make that mistake. I know, right? <laughs> but they, they do give a, a lot of consideration to that. But um, I, I like to say when patients challenge me about how long it's taking for them to get better, that uh, this is a little bit of a cheap out. But I'll say, look, it's it's an, an amazing. Your mind's unbelievably complex and complicated, and it's not a tremendous shock that it's difficult to fix it. I don't think you'd want to be simpler so that it would be easy to find a drug to do this. And I really do think that's true. If you imagine consciousness, that's why, that's also what brought to mind the story about running away from the bear. Maybe somewhere along the line I'd say, well, for sure now I'm fearful of the bear, right? right? Whether or not I first bolted because I saw one. And that uh, the, the symbolic rendering of a, a, a fearful object or a beloved object or the object of jealousy, whatever, whatever, so the, the symbolic representation of that may very well sit in the very part of the brain that you're interested in, uh, you know, associating with consciousness of the prefrontal pole. And uh, the, the, the mechanisms, which are novel to humans, you say, and I accept, uh, are not the sorts of mechanisms that re respond easily to being infused with a certain, you know, molecule. So I don't think it's, it would be possible to change the content of a conscious thought right. with a drug. I mean, how would you even design that? Uh, uh, th exactly. That's exactly what I'd say. You know, it's interesting because the, the sort of obverse is that is p patients, because they've read that subdrugs can induce suicidal thinking, uh, really, which I think is done largely uh, more bad than good because a lot of people stay away from medicines that otherwise help them, really literally get this notion that this will put this idea in my head, you know. And I guess in some sense that's kind of true, but it's not, it's not an idea that's being inserted into their head, mm -hmm. right? It's some level of arousal and agitation and, un, and dysphoria and happiness that might then lead to it, but it's not as though you're suddenly brainwashed. That's the sort of idea. And uh, that's exactly why when we're trying to make people unfearful, it, 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 and, and when their object of fear can be a very complex affair, it can be very not just a bear, but something much more complicated than that, it's very difficult to figure out a way to neutralize those. those I think the drug ideas. companies would be better off if they sold these as avoided medicines or mm -hmm. um, you know, physiological arousal mm -hmm. reducers. Uh, that would be much more accurate and it would create the right expectation of what's going to happen with the medication as opposed to fear or anxiety medication. Uh, absolutely. No, I, look, I think, you know, the. The basic outline of how the mental health field tries to deal with these conditions uh, is reasonable enough, I'd say, because 
but it's not in practice always done very well. That is, uh, most people understand, I guess PTSD is a great example of this because it's so difficult to treat and uh, many people who have that condition do take medications for it, and I think for good reason, but it's very clear that's just one step in a sort of rehabilitation. And the rehabilitation, which is sort of like the rehabilitation of another cro other chronic illnesses, involve, you know, what, uh, it involve a community, you know. Uh, it's not just uh, this thing or that thing getting them better. Uh, they, need, it's like they need therapy, they need the meds, they need to uh, expose themselves to what they're fearful of. This reminds me of um, a large body of literature, and some of which is greatly debated, about what's called the integrative phenotype. And that is, it's as you go into more and more complicated organisms, and I'm not sure we can identify or quantify complication, but we can think of the human mind as one of the most complicated organs, that it's such an integrated phenotype that it's very difficult to target a particular aspect of that phenotype that doesn't have a generic effect. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, much of science is reductionism. We think that we can reduce complicated ideas to some very simple phenomena and laws, but as we really begin to look at biology in particular, we realize that reductionism is uh, only the first step. After you reduce all the components, you then have to rebuild conceptually f and, and integrate all of those factors, and then you see a large number of emergent properties that could never have been predicted based on those very simple physical laws and relationships. So I'm, I'm, I'm resonating with this discussion about pharmacological uh, solutions to behavioral issues because it's not, it's one organ. Right. And you're looking at just one facet of its behavior. There's another condition that's not as, uh, as often advertised uh, as being a common um, target for psychotherapy or psychopharmacology, and that is the state, and this pertains to consciousness, state of depersonalization, where people feel detached from themselves. And what's amazing here, again, is uh, I think that term covers a, a wide gamut of experiences. I mean, I've had patients who say they feel uh, they have no, uh, like, as if they have no working memory, like, as if they have no conscious scratch pad. They're not, you know, like they're sort of, they feel like an automaton. Hmm. And there are others who won't say that, but they feel very disconnected from their emotions. They feel them, but they're muted and they feel distant from them. There's a really a wide range of uh, abnormal states, and that's also something very difficult, by the way, to treat. And it's from, from my way of thinking, because it involves ideas about the self, which are so complex, as a, you know, if you talk about different uh, concepts built around emotions, so then just think how many there are built around myself, mm -hmm. right? Um, there are so many flavors of depersonalization, and it's a, it's a challenging condition to treat. Um, the other, I, I, we're going to open it up for questions, but there was one other, I think, oddball state that I just wanted to hear everyone's thought about, or anyone who wants to comment on, and that is sort of the opposite of blind sight, which is this Anton syndrome. Right, where people right, who, are, who are blind, in fact, and provably blind because they can't walk through with obstacles and such, who insist that they can see. Now, this is, and of course, it's often referred to as a state of confabulation. So they're, they're making excuses for their blindness, but even in the most absurd circumstances, they'll go to absurd lengths to insist that they can see. So now I wonder, okay, are they conscious of seeing? What, what, what's going on in that situation? David, do you have any thoughts on that? Well, <laughs> I think that they could have conscious visual states. Yeah. Uh, and, but it's a tricky thing. Uh, and people in the consciousness racket debate some about this. But my own view is um, since, so here's a visual state and just by itself, it isn't conscious. Uh, it will be responsive to stimulate, but that's all. 
then uh, there will be what I call a high order awareness of the state. That is to say, the individual will be aware uh, of being in the state. Uh, one will be aware of oneself as being in the state. Uh, so this is a separate state. Uh, so now you can take away that. And then you would still have some kind of visual awareness, right? Without the, uh, so that is to say, you would be aware of yourself as seeing. You would be aware of yourself as being in a visual state, even though, in mm -hmm. point of fact, as we, as you mentioned, biologically, we know that there is no visual state. Uh, but that's not the way it is for the individual. Right. right, and I don't see any reason why uh, this wouldn't be the case. I think with these Anton's patients, it's a bit of a question how fine-grained it is and w what the nature of the visual consciousness is, but it seems as though this particular model of what it is for uh, psychological functioning to be conscious uh, uh, provides a very nice explanation of what's going on here. So you're, you're the patient you described sounds more like Charles Bonnet. I'm sorry? It sounds more like the Charles Bonnet syndrome uh, that Richard and Hakwan... Uh, oh, yes, right. Uh, where yes. there's a, a lesion of visual cortex, That's and the right. person still has these vision, uh, can report these visual yeah. experiences. But what's, what's the damage or what's the condition in Anton's? This. Neurological. You know, I'm not sure I know. Let's see. It's, oh, it's some uh, uh, it breach. It's no, there's some disconnection between the fibers that travel from the occipital lobe towards the uh, temporal parietal lobes. Okay, okay. So, so it's the same. Yeah, yeah. Same basic idea. Yeah. 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 It's, it, 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 from the in terms of what we're talking about, it's basically it's a the same kind of but, it, but, it, but it's interesting that they're so productive. Uh, in, in, I think in general, we could have a whole talk on confabulation one day. Uh, or at least I'll have one, and you know, I'll pretend all the rest of you are here. Um, that uh, that is very productive, and I wonder about this idea, this sort of like this uh, gestalt completion that uh, uh, concepts and sometimes pr actually create consciousness yeah. of some sort. There's this great paper. Well, uh, there's a great paper from the the 90s um, looking at color space representations in congenitally blind individuals versus sighted individuals, and they you know sort uh, color uh, concepts as similar and different, and then you can use multidimensional scaling to uh, infer what's seen as similar and what's seen as different by people, and what they find is that. This is Shepard and Cooper, I think. Um, what they find is that congenitally blind individuals have a representation of color space that's remarkably akin to sighted individuals. And so via language, people are, yeah. are forming exactly. representations that are then shaping some sort of conscious yeah, experience. They're you know, talking was, to people, so yeah, yeah. They, they have that input. Yeah. It was uh, studies of confabulation in split-brain patients that made me turn to rats to study emotion. Yeah. Um, so I was, we studied these patients whose brains are split in half to control epilepsy and would ask the, right, the left hemisphere, which you could talk to, why you did a certain behavior that had been elicited from the right hemisphere. So the left hemisphere has no internal information about what's in the right hemisphere, but can observe the behavior that's being produced. And the left hemisphere would make up all these narratives, these explanations, confabulations, to make it all make sense. And so we were discussing this, my mentor and I, Mike Cassano, were discussing this, uh, and we said, well, maybe emotion systems are something that would be generating behaviors non-consciously that would require this kind of explanation. Right. So the light bulb went off in my head, and I said, OK. And so I left, once I left Mike's lab, I started doing rat research, ended up in the amygdala, and here we are today. That's great. Mm -hmm. All right, well, I think we should open up for questions. If people want to, please, one at a time, and please um, make sure it's a question and not an elaborate <laughs> commentary, if you don't mind, and um, take it away. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I'm a big fan of your work. Synaptic stuff is very crucial in my life. Uh, Mike, Close to the mic, please. Hi, Mike. Does it work now? No. So, so if, if you are right that Donald Trump might win again, I'm afraid. The, the reason I say is that, you know, we, we have to talk about representations as well. 
because propaganda is extremely successful and we have technologies to make people think a specific thought at the same time. Billions of people can think that way. And we all know that conditioning works. Pavlov's experiments have proven that conditioning could be, you know, is effective and uh, an organism could be made to salivate on arbitrary things. So my question is that knowing that homo sapiens are tribal and they start as narcissists, are there any representations which can make us more humanistic, more planetary conscious, more peace-loving, more human rights-loving? Thank you. Well, we have to figure out how to make that appealing to people, uh, <laughs> which it apparently is not. Anybody else have anything brilliant to say? Well, I think attending Helix Center uh, now tables. <laughs> But thank you for your, your comment. Uh, Noah Harari, in his popular, in several senses of the word, uh, book, Sapiens, talks about about 70,000 years ago, a consciousness revo res revolution. Uh, have you read the book? You know what I'm talk I know what you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, well, what, what do you, as, as professionals, really, in the field, what do you think of that, that concept? Well, uh, if consciousness, as we humans understand it, uh, in our own particular way, is part of our, our evolutionary history as a species, not necessarily as an animal, um, then yeah, maybe that's when it happened. I mean, that's a, a wild guess in terms of putting a number on that. Yeah, I was sort of wondering about the assessment of the data that, that Harari used um, to, to, to find that out, to, yeah, or, I mean, or to claim it, shall we say. I think that, you know, he's a great writer. I'm not sure he's That's a true. great scientist in terms of all of the stuff. Well, but, uh, right, about what I Even though we talk a lot about consciousness, it seems to me that most cultures have also developed techniques to become unconscious or un at least unselfconscious, such as Buddhism seeks to become unselfconscious and connected in a form of unity, where in other cases, depersonalization, we're becoming unselfconscious and it's fractionated depersonalization, so it can go either way. But one seems to be much better state than the other. But in that regard, can we look at death as a means, final means, to assure unconsciousness? Well, the same way as we use alcohol, drugs, dance, trance, any other method. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, Plato said he looked forward to death so that he could be pure conscious, or pure mind. Uh, <laughs> Uh, back in 2016, I was so struck by Rudolf Ulinas' comment about, oh. <laughs> about the improbability of cells coming together to form a multicellular organism and remain then as a unified entity, that it struck me that would require a mechanism to make that happen. That would, that would be a turning point. And that mechanism you could begin to identify with consciousness, provided you remove self-awareness from consciousness. And therefore, if we thought of consciousness as, first of all, the unifying element of what brings multicellularity into a unified being, and then we humans came along later and added the ability to turn that on ourselves and to understand our own consciousness. So I wondered if, you'd, if you see that shift to multicellularity as being, even if you don't agree with my connection with consciousness, if you see it as being like a fundamental turning point in evolution that must have led to a new set of characteristics coming about, even if you are not agreeing with them being called, some of them being called yeah, consciousness. Not the consciousness part in terms of <laughs> the other part. Too. Okay, so um, that first step towards multicellularity, the formation of some kind of colonial organization, in each lineage that has achieved that, it has achieved it by virtue of an extracellular adhesive. Now what's interesting to me is the fact that different lineages have used different materials to accomplish adhesion. I'll give you an example. Almost all of the cells in your body are adhering because of transmembrane proteins called cadherins. The cells in the plant body are stuck together 
by virtue of pectins, which are carbohydrates. So our bodies are stuck together by proteins, plants are stuck together by carbohydrates. And if you look at the metabolism of what a photosynthetic versus non-photosynthetic organism does, it makes intuitive sense. Carbohydrates are cheap, proteins are relatively easy to make because of the physiology of the animal. So um, that's not consciousness because Every unicellular ancestor has used the adhesive for a different purpose. So for example, we think of unicellular things as, well, they don't stick together. Well, of course they do. If, the, if reproduction requires two cells to come together, they have to adhere. And they're using that adhesive to form the colonial organism. So um, contingency uh, and uh, co-option co-opting the use of something as an adhesive here that now gives you an adhesion here. The real major step is not sticking together, it's working together. Right. And our species has yet to accomplish that. <laughs> <laughs> More scotch tape. <laughs> <laughs> More like red tape. <laughs> Joe, I haven't yet had the uh, pleasure of reading your book, but um, would you perhaps... Um, characterize how your work differs from Antonio Damasio's, because it seems to me to be the converse that you're suggesting. Yeah, so Antonio and I have been on writing books about, about emotion roughly the same amount of time. And we, um, you know, we have different perspectives um, that ultimately come together in terms of the, the higher levels. So for him, you know, he started out by saying that the uh, somatic marker hypothesis which is the idea that body signals, somatic signals that reach the brain are interpreted uh, as defining the emotion. Um, so my view is that, that it, those, those signals are important in modulating the experience but not defining it. Okay. So that's the main distinction. But Antonio had an interesting component to that which he called the as if loop. So if you don't have the body states, you can conceptualize, you can simulate it. And for me, all emotions are these kinds of simulations rather than uh, these predetermined events. Fascinating. And if I may, just one other question. Um, perhaps the brain is a distributed system. Um, beyond what's in the skull, of course, it started with the gut. The tube uh, was the first brain This evolved subsequently. And of course, there's a lot of work now going on around microbiome. In fact, work with rats, um, you know, reared in a sterile environment, having a propensity to be more anxious than those with a stable, healthy gut microbiome. In fact, plants have just come away from a conference where it's discovered that tiny filaments and plant roots that actually co-opt bacteria mm -hmm. in to do work with them and then expel them out into the environment uh, later on. Um, is it perhaps um, that the brain is a distributed system, the amygdala, amygdala perhaps part of it, but it's much broader challenge than that? Uh, well, the, where there is, I, I guess, distributed processing within the brain. I don't know. I mean, it seems uh, I'm not sure what you mean exactly. What I'm talking about is, um, in fact, a lot of work that's going on at the moment uh, about gut-brain axis mm -hmm. anxiety as a function of dysbiosis in the right. gut. Uh, the, mm -hmm. the, 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 oh, you mean that the, the, the body is a distributed system in the brain? I'm talking about actually the ecology of microorganisms right. in the gut being another uh, community Absolutely. that's contributing to the right. concept of intelligence. Intelligence. Yeah, I mean, you know, you could use intelligence. Or anxiety. In You're right. Yes, I mean, we're. <laughs> so I mean, I, I agree. I mean, we, we're doing some work on the microbiome now, okay. and so um, yeah, I think it's you know, it's all one system, obviously, and I think the brain is, you know, special, but I'm biased. Thanks. I mean, but just to put this into perspective about you know the the history of life, um, if we think we can think of the amygdala as a continuation of that first bacterial cell that had to detect and respond to danger. It's the, I'm not saying the amygdala itself, but the circuits within the amygdala that detect and respond to danger are just a continuation of that, that, that protective survival imperative that we have. And so the amygdala and other parts of the brain that, that do those kinds of things are just allowing a, a big multicellular organism accomplish those goals. If I can add to that, um, absolutely, I agree. Um, we used to think of plant, a tree as a separate organism, 
And now our ecological evolutionary perspective is, well, yes, it's an individual. It will have a life and death. And individuality is another concept that's somewhat difficult to define. But we now know that those tree trees are actually interconnected to neighboring trees mm. by uh, mycorrhizae and bacterial colonies, and that they're actually capable of exchanging nutrients. Um, and that is that one tree that is overproducing can actually contribute to the carbohydrate gain of another and sharing uh, minerals and things like that. So, we're, you know, this integrated phenotype, what is the individual from an evolutionary or a biological point of view, it's really a fascinating topic. What about the idea that we're just here to support bacteria? Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> No comment. <laughs> Hi, forgive me, I have not read your book, but I was thoroughly interested in coming here. Um, I guess I have a two-part question. The first um, is from the description itself. It says, emotions, um, you concluded in your book, result from our efforts to make sense of the significant moments in our lives. And forgive me if I missed it, I don't recall your, uh, could you comment on that? So, preceding that, I'm trying to reconstruct where that sentence came from, but preceding, is that from the description here? Yes. Okay, so in the book, that idea uh, is preceded by the fact that we have these biological uh, systems that control our, you know, uh, survival activities in terms of, you know, finding food, mates, uh, balancing fluids, finding liquids, and so forth, and all of these things that that are important in the ecology of daily life, and emotions are a conscious awareness of those significant things, and putting those significant things out of biological. Uh, out of the biological context and into a psychological context. Not that psychology isn't biological, but allowing us to experience what we're doing when we have these biologically significant moments. Thank you. And so this also goes to the gentleman next to you, but obviously for anybody, um, the, psycho the psychopharmacologist, um, uh, and you just mentioned, uh, I guess, the juxtaposition between, um, you said not that psycho psychology is not biological. So my question had to do with what, what effect does the taking of, let's say, multiple psychopharmacological drugs, not only for anxiety, but mood stabilizers, a whole bunch, and in the long term, et cetera, uh, have on perception and behavior. And we're talking about That's humans here. Question, let's see. <laughs> I guess it depends uh, on which, what medicines you're, t what agents you're talking about. I think um, the most uh, concise way to respond to that would be uh, Forgive me for interrupting, because before yeah. you did, you did a really good job of saying, well, uh, these psych meds or, or any sort of meds or anxiety meds cannot change your thinking, but you were talking about the, the suicide warning. They're not, you know, they're not I, I, I wouldn't say they can't change, well, no, they don't implant ideas in your mind, that's, that's for sure. They can change the way you think about things in, in important ways, that's for sure. But I, what I was about to say, which I think is the most concise way to respond to you and to the concern about what are the, you didn't say adverse, but it's implied, I guess, adverse effects of taking lots of pills over time. Uh, or just the so, effect. Okay. Because uh, they don't do studies on it. The, the um, especially you're right, when it's multiple meds, they certainly don't. Um, all I'll say is that the, a person's ability to function uh, be creative, be alert, sleep well, wake up, have energy, all of those things. Those factors are more important in the long run than the number of medicines you take. So the bad outcome would be someone who's taking lots of medicines and, and they are thereby very impaired in terms of their alertness or their cognition and so forth uh, and uh, they shouldn't be on all those medicines. But when people really, uh, and it requires a careful analysis and a discussion, and it's not something that necessarily can happen in one quick session, but in the long term, uh, looking at how well that person is sort of uh, uh, 
fitting into their lives in a, I call it just generally a healthy way, then typically, with a few exceptions based on blood tests you have to get once in a while, typically the effects are good. That's what I would say. Okay? There are lots of uh, exceptions to it, but uh, watching the overall sort of uh, uh, functional state of the, of the individual is more important. I guess one perfect example would be, there's a, it's a, it's a short one, it's only one type of medicine, that's there's, there was a great fear uh, that it arose a few, backs because of, a few years back because of a study that said benzodiazepines cause dementia. And uh, I felt that study wasn't well done and uh, there was a, a follow-up study, large uh, multi, uh, 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 multi-institution study that found that no, the, the, the connection was false. Okay, it, it may yet still be debatable, but I do know this, anxiety, in the elderly is a very uh, strong um, a risk factor for dementia. Okay, so when you confront, well, what now? Now you have to make a choice, and there are important choices, and there are ways to do it intelligently. But it would be wrong to assume that the medicine necessarily is going to have a negative outcome uh, mm-hmm. net. So, okay. Thank you. Sure. Um, as I was uh, listening, I was on the various themes here. I was trying to um, put it in a context of some other research in a different field. Um, and perhaps uh, Joseph and, and Kristen might uh, come in on this. Um, a quorum sensing um, in bacteria and, and the ideas of uh, how bacteria, first of all, are not solitary. They're social, and that took a long time for the field to come to that uh, conclusion and, and the research to, 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 to start from that as the, as the, the foundation. And similarly, um, consciousness um, is social, it's not solitary. I mean, there's the solitary expression of it uh, within an individual, but that's still mediated by all of the other influences that have been social. And um, the one thing that sort of hit me when you we talk about the consciousness and developmentally, you know, around two and three years old, well, you know, the, the terrible twos, the tantrums. If I don't get my way, I'm going to start screaming and crying. Well, when that stops, and the the child becomes more pro-social, that's when the consciousness component of it develops. So I think that that's a very interesting uh, uh, thing to you know to, to start looking at. Any responses? Everything said about quorum. Um, well, I can respond only in terms of the comment about bacteria, and that is, it's very interesting because quorum sensing in bacteria, we think, uh, is a mechanism to gauge the availability of nutrients in the environment. So, by sensing the size of the population and the extent to which the population might be growing or diminishing, that is a feedback as to the availability of nutrients for the collective. What's interesting to me is that in a lot of bacteria, the molecule that's used for quorum sensing, which is indolicidic acid, or IAA, is used by plants as a signaling molecule to go from the tips of leaves and the tips of roots and the tips of stems. So it's a beautiful example of where quorum sensing and the mechanism that was used by bacteria has now been highly elaborated and sophisticated in terms of now communicating amongst the cells within the plant body. Great. I want to make one quick announcement after our next question, which has to be our last one. We're going to have the pleasure of listening to, I don't know if you know this, but Joe is a music uh, a performer and he's going to put on a small performance for us with the guitar. Very Should small. I go? Yes, last one. Yeah, yeah regarding um, the consciousness of vision, uh, in the words of great cognitive scientist um, Stevie Wonder. Just just because a man cannot see does not mean he does not have a great vision. Is this working? But seriously, folks, um, human-designed experiments, one one person smiles, human-designed experiments have shown that species as greatly separated from us as birds, 
can figure out human design puzzles and strategize and plan ahead, knowing that they'll, if they figure out a multi-step puzzle, they'll get to the reward, the food. Um, we know that dogs can dream. Uh, we know a, do a dog will sacrifice its own, its own life to save a human being. And I believe there are documented cases of urban cats jumping out of high rises knowingly that they're jumping to their deaths uh, because of uh, disturbances, you know, loud noises in the city. So my question is when we design, when humans design experiments uh, to test if animals have consciousness, when it's, it's obvious to a lot of people that they do. Isn't this, uh, you know, what we're talking about here today, isn't this really more anthropomorphic chauvinism well, than as, science? As we said, if, if all we needed was intuition, we wouldn't need to do science. But it's very, now, it's difficult, maybe impossible, to know what's on the mind of another animal. But no one's saying they But the experiments animal. we design are designed by using our own biases. Right. I don't do those, so. Yes, I think. Oh, this is a quick one. We have one. We have a quick one. Real quick, right Sorry. CCNY. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Buell Gallagher. Uh, no. No. Pre. Yes. Okay. I'm that old. CCNY. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, human beings, Homo sapiens, have been on this earth for about. 200,000 years, we're also hybrids. We're Neanderthals, Denisovans, and perhaps some other uh, species. We're a brand new species. Only in the last 10,000 years have we created civilization and now technology. Uh, and, and ways to kill ourselves. And one of the people here who spoke, one of the gentlemen, talked about this may be the end, and yet, it may be the end, and can we fix it? Well, we are, we are evolved monkeys. We are evolved chimpanzees. If you look at chimpanzees, they're always after each other. There's a, uh, uh, a male, alpha male, and uh, they're fighting, they're killing, and so on. The question is, what can we do with our, ourselves as humans, as homo sapiens, to change that aspect of ourselves which is built into us. Does anyone have an answer? Yeah. Find a common enemy. Yeah. Oh, I, that's us. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I can't think of any one, you know, a, a quick response to that because I just think that the, 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 there are so many ways, there are so many ways in which that can be uh, affected for the better, but. It's, there are too many things to, to enumerate, I'm sorry to say. And again, I was joking about the Helix Center, but having general discussions of this sort, and it's a little bit of a joke, but not, is a, extending humanism as a, as a sort of a guiding principle is a good way to do that. So with that, as soon as we're all set. All right, if anyone uh, wants to get up and leave, you can do that now. No, no, uh, no hard feelings. Take, please take your time. So I'm only going to play uh, three short songs, and the, uh, we were originally supposed to have a larger group here, but uh, we couldn't get everybody together, so we canceled the whole thing. Then at the last minute, I decided to do something I never do, which is perform by myself. So <laughs> let's see how that goes. All right, so um, we have a band called the Amygdaloids, and we invented our own genre called heavy mental is music about mind and brain and mental disorders and uh, we've actually played here for the New York psychoanalytic uh, Christmas party once upstairs there's a video on the web about that that uh, just came across all right I'm gonna do a song uh, called my mind's eye if you look into my mind's eye 
you would see the way that I cry deep inside in my mind's eye we had love it was good you were there you understood everything yes everything can't always trust what you think you know you can't trust what you believe sometimes your mind just puts on a show it simply deceives in my mind's eye you were mine but in my mind's eye was blind if you look into my mind's eye You would see the way that I cry Deep inside, in my mind's eye Can't always trust what you think you know Can't trust what you believe Sometimes your mind just puts on a show It simply deceives my mind's eye, you were mine, but my mind's eye was blind. My mind's eye was blind. My mind's eye was blind, oh yeah. My mind's eye was blind. Okay, thank you. So, sometimes when I write a book, I write songs that go with the, uh, the book. And that's what we were going to play here today. Um, and some of this has electronic music and so forth, which obviously we won't have today. So I'm just going to do one song from the book, uh, which is called Life. There are, there are four songs in the book. One is called As Soon As There Is Life, There Is Danger. Um, and another is about, you know, these are kind of dystopian, either beginning of the world or end of the world songs, except this one, which is about beginning and end of life. Oh, yes. All of the things that I think about Are also things that I think that I doubt I can't keep straight all the things in my mind Too many thoughts and too little time And life, life, life the States of mind, they come and go Sometimes fast and sometimes slow Some leave a trace in my brain Others just wax and wane in life Life Life, 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 life. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. And thanks, Kristen, Carl.
David and Gerald. And the Helix Center. And Miguel back there in the booth. Okay. All right. Thank you. March 14th. Oh, boy. Hi, <laughs> 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 